Um, some of them know me. Uh, I'm Julita. I was living in Peru until 2017. I started to do events in, to promote genome since 2011. The last year I was able to do around 12 events. And in total in Peru I did more, uh, a number in numbers like 30 events in favor or to, con to promote the genome work. So after 2017, I was living in the USA, and I also did events in, to promote the uh, Linux work. And this year, in 2011, in 18, I was living in Edinburgh. So I'm going to present what I did with the ex previous experience that I had. I know that I have to have a good design for the banner, so I gathered for my classmates in the master, so they have some knowledge about Linux, but they used Ubuntu, they didn't have much um, knowledge of what genome is, so I had to start with meetings with them. So um, I also, thanks to the genome board or the foundation, I was able to, to distribute some banners around the university. You see some faculties here, I'm just showing pictures because it's a fast lighting talk. And I put it everywhere, as you see here in pictures, in the coffee shop, um, everywhere. And thanks also to some friends, I was able to work on it, like and some designs um, weekends and in the night. So this is our result. Uh, we have a nice frame and to share with our attendees. And I didn't, I won't say like I didn't succeed at all because I didn't gather a large uh, number of attendees, but uh, it was an experience in the university. I noticed that there's not much knowledge about what genome is or the community, so thanks to the University of Edinburgh that they helped me, and also to Albert Van Hul, who was uh, helping remotely. So I wanna show you a video here, if I am able to show. <laughs> it's a... Um, Thank you. Today, I am going to present these two main free software projects. How many of you have heard about Fedora and Gnome? Fedora Chain has a new release every two years, guys. I hope you can install it. Uh, okay, I'm now out of time. Thank you so much again, Ginom, you know, for all these years.
So who's next? Well. So next up, we have Companion App Development by Brit Seattle. Let's welcome. Hi, everybody. Uh, I don't know what that is. That's not me. Um, <laughs> uh, I don't need to have slides because all of you guys have my work on your phones. So everyone pull out your phone real quick. Everyone whip it out. Prove to me that you downloaded my app. <laughs> so as you've noticed this year, we had a new kind of Skunk Works initiative that turned into some like pseudo official, actually halfway decent, uh, uh, companion app project. So um, that kind of started as just, I don't know, it was like a Saturday morning and I was like, yeah, I can make an app. And then I, <laughs> like a month and a half later when lots of missed sleep made it happen with the help of four or five other people. So um, I think it turned out pretty well. Uh, the app is, was originally created by a company in the UK named Lemberg Solutions um, for DrupalCon. Um, it's called Confa. Confa is like the platform that they provide. And they hadn't updated the code base in about five years, so I took the code. Uh, the code had a server to provide the information and then three clients. There's an iOS, an Android, and a web client. Um, you okay? <laughs> so so uh, I took all three clients and I took this five-year-old set of code on three different platforms and in two of the cases, I improved them and made them better. In the iOS case, I pretty miserably failed. Um, it turns out that Xcode kind of sucks. I hate it. <laughs> and Objective-C also is awful. Um, if anyone knows how to program for iOS, that would be awesome to get your help for, for, for subsequent years. But yeah, so the issues of that one were uh, you have to use a Mac to use Xcode. Um, and then you have to, and then if you don't have an iPhone, you have to use an iOS emulator inside of Xcode. And if you don't have any of that, you have to run a VM, and then you have to run an emulator in the VM. So you're like three VMs deep, and things just take an hour and a half to do anything. And so the iOS app didn't happen, but the web app, I think, actually turned out quite nice. Um, you think it's awesome? I think it's awesome. So thank you, everyone. So hopefully you're all uh, really enjoying it. I'd love to continue this initiative moving forward. There's already been some interest to have it at Libre Application Summit. Uh, Nomasia um, mentioned, or people have mentioned that it'd be really great at Nomasia, and then uh, Fedora, maybe at Fedora's conference, they would want to use it. But the code's all open source. Uh, right now we currently have our own fork of the main client software because we had to rewrite like close to half of the code to get it working. It turns out web technology moves pretty fast, and in five years, things are very different. So Angular 2 is very different than Angular 8. So, um, but since we did the, the hard work, uh, in theory, to use it at whatever conference you want should just be changing a couple XML files, put whatever colors you want, a banner, and call it good. So um, whoever wants to hop on the project, I'd be happy to help out. And then I think uh, Adrian has volunteered to <laughs> make a GTK uh, native app of it, which would be pretty cool. So maybe for next year, we'll actually have uh, the Guadic Companion app in the Flatpak store and in the Snap store. So um, if anyone wants to be involved in any of these initiatives, I'm happy to facilitate. Uh, the code is up on the engagement team GitLab. Um, and I hope you're all enjoying it. That's, that's it. Okay, for the next one, we'll have um, Alexander Larson talking about G3, 3D rendering in GTK. That's welcome. Alright, um, so this is talking about G3. I'm going to go fast here so I can show some demos at the end. Uh, 3.js is a um, JavaScript library. It's been around forever. Uh, it's used for WebGL. It's kind of complicated to use. So you use 3GL to do web stuff if you're not like a hardcore uh, uh, like GPU guy. 
it's not a web engine like Unreal Engine and the other things. It's more like a bag of Lego bits you can sort of do whatever you want with. So I took this code, called the G-Tree, ported it to, like, ported all the JavaScript to C and to your object, and then I just keep all the GLSL, the, the GPU code, and I use OpenGL and GTK GL area for rendering stuff, and the Graphene library for 3D mat, which is going to be later by Vasi. Um, short talk about the API. The major thing is the scene graph. This is like the major, major object in the scene graph. The ones on the left are kind of like physical objects you see in the thing. The other side is things that affect how it's rendered. So you can have multiple cameras of multiple types in the graph and they get like rotated to where they are. And then you can pick which, which of these cameras is actually used to render stuff. Or you can, like, you can render multiple times from different uh, positions and whatnot. Uh, so, and then you create a scene hierarchy starting from the scene and then you add all the objects you want to be a part of the rendering. Uh, most of it is kind of obvious. Mesh means like a bunch of vertexes with the triangles between them. Bones is just like a dummy object that is used to connect, connect all the bones into a skeleton structure and then you can use those to deform the, the mesh that they're part of. And then we have like various materials you, you can add to the different objects. The most basic one is just like make this red or make this green or whatever. And the other one is more complicated, light-based things. Lambert shading, phone shading are things you know of if you ever did any 3D uh, like theory of 3D, 3D graphics. These days, most things are, are moved to something called physically-based rendering. And the standard material is like the standard physically based rendering material, which is very useful because it's, it's the same in different kinds of engines, right? So whereas a Fong, uh, a Fong material kind of fakes things, so they always look different depending on how you set that things up. And we, can all, we also have a shader library, or a shader material where you can like plug in random code and do fancy effects. Depth, there's a depth material that you know renders to the depth of the thing you're rendering. These are kind of special things you can use for effects and stuff. There's an animation system based on the uh, Unreal Engine one. You basically uh, specify a bunch of keyframes of different sorts and you can use them to deform the skeleton or just animate between uh, different keyframes. Right, so we use, have a standardized GLTF file format that we use. We have like a bunch of effects, and we have a demo. Yeah, so we have like, these are just, these are just basic materials. You can do colors of various kinds, and lines and stuff. Like the various, like they all have the same colors, but you can see they, 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 some of them are flat, and some of them are shaded in different ways. We have environment maps, and we have, shadow maps of different sorts for the different light types. Here we have like GLTF loaders that have things like uh, built-in animations in the file format. And the robot thing has like this emoji thing so we can make it angry and like dance at the same time or whatever. Uh, we have things like shaders can do effects the grayscale, whatever. Sprites, um, like points, these are particle systems. You can use multiple views. I made a game using this thing. So you can like play games. This is like 3,000 lines of C. So it's, it's kind of nice. Yeah, yeah. Th these are, so, so the, the, the boxes are the skeletons and they turn and they affect the mesh. Here's like a keyframe animation. All right, I'm out of time. Bunch of stuff. <laughs> you know, whatever. Now it's full? Yep. For the next one, we'll have uh, Will Thompson talking about flat pack external data checker. Let's welcome. Thanks very much. I'm not sure how I can follow that. So, 
Um, yeah, if you're expecting more amazing things like that, this is going to be a little more code based and a little less spinning cubes based. Um, so when you, this is a, a little side project that various people at Endless have been working on over the past, uh, going on for two years. Um, for a bit of background, when an app makes a new release, then um, the Flatpak manifest needs to be updated for it to reach um, users getting, who get it from Flathub. And in the happy path, the maintainer of the app in the upstream is also the maintainer of the app on Flathub. So they can just do this as part of the regular stable release process and everyone's happy, it gets updated uh, in a kind of push fashion. Um, for packages where it's a, a, a third party who maintains the FlatHub manifest, that's not going to work. Um, and so in the uh, benign case, if the manifest gets out of date, then users just get an old version of the app. Like it's not ideal, but it's fine. But for apps which use the extra data feature to download and unpack um, external files when you install the app, um, if the external file has changed or become unaccessible, this means the app is no longer installable. So that was the original motivation for working on this. Um, taking Dropbox as an example, um, whenever they push out a new release, which they do at roughly every month to six weeks, um, this is the kind of diff that you need of the manifest. You need to change the version number in the URL, update the checksum and the size of that file. And of course you need to test this and make sure that it actually works and there's not some change that's needed in the surrounding sandbox. But like this is normally all, all that's necessary. And this really feels like something that a, a machine can do rather than a human. Uh, and indeed, a machine can do it. Um, there's a little bit of extra metadata uh, in this file uh, which tells the tool how to update this. So what this, what, what this is telling it is that there, there is a second URL which always redirects to the latest version of the Dropbox um, tuple. So the checker can follow this um, URL, follow the redirect, um, record the URL it was redirected to, check some size, and then send a pull request. Um, and at this point it enters the normal FlatHub build machinery. So the, um, the build bot builds a test build, uh, which you can, as the maintainer, you presumably you get an email about a new pull request, you install the test build, you check that it works, and then you click merge. So you don't have to manually go and find any checksums or, or, and so on. Um, so this is pretty nice. Um, there are some kind of interesting corner cases. You can see the, the fourth line of the diff at the bottom. Um, where it's changing the white space. It's actually pretty tricky to um, avoid making spurious changes uh, when you're editing a JSON file programmatically, um, and it, it doesn't try to. For YAML, it's a bit better because um, there are libraries that try hard to preserve formatting and comments and so on. So this is a rare instance of saying uh, me saying a positive thing about YAML, but there we go. Um, um, yeah, um, so how can you use it? Well, the, the first thing is that although it, it can check whether URLs are reachable and fail and send me an email if they are not reachable, um, it doesn't know how to fix them unless you give it a little bit of extra metadata. Um, so you can add, it's normally three or four lines to your manifest, um, which tells the checker how to find the latest version of different modules. Um, and then right now it's only run for a, a list of a dozen or so apps. So uh, you have to go and add it to a hard-coded list in this repository here. Um, there's just details in the readme for that of what the metadata looks like for the checker. Um, what's next? Well, there's some things that it doesn't do which make it a little bit, it's still a little bit um, rough around the edges. It doesn't update the um, release date and version in the app data file, which is now mandatory. Um, so right now the maintainer has to add that by hand. It already knows how to scrape the release number out of various different um, checker mechanisms because it can also look in um, Debian app repos in some cases, which of course has a version number right there. So I think it's just a matter of wiring it up to um, patch that file as well. Um, there's this existing project called Release Monitoring, which has um, version information for lots of projects. It would be nice to wire these two things together. Um, I think it would be good to, make, to move this to check all, all the repos on FlatHub uh, with an opt-out of some form. Um, and in order to do that, I think probably that means moving it from Endless's CI to um, the FlatHub build infrastructure. Uh, I don't know if Bart's around. Maybe we should talk about that at some point. Um, there are a number of other issues that which we could like feature ideas for this, which are all here. Um, contributions welcome. Speaking of contributions, the original author was Joachim. I worked on make, teaching it to actually file the pull requests. Uh, Andrea recently actually put that into production. It's the kind of last 90% thing of you, know, you have working code, got to run it in production. It's kind of fiddly. Um, and there have been various com uh, contributions from inside and outside Endless, and I hope we can make this list longer. Thank you very much.
So for the next one, we'll have Ibanyo Lebossi yeah. talk, okay, talking about graphing. Maths is hard, but CPU is harder. Let's welcome. <sighs> Hello, everyone. So it turns out that 3D graphics is really a lot of math. Um, you start with vectors that are just four floats in a struct, and you add four of those inside a matrix, and you're done. But then you get lots of math on top of that, and then lots of math on top of that, and then really lots of math on top of that. Yay. Um, luckily for us, GPUs are really fast in math. They have wide registers. You can drive a truck through them. Um, you, it, they are optimized to like operate on large chunks of data. They deal really badly with branching. Uh, CPUs are not that good. They're sh really shitty GPUs. Um, they have small registers. Uh, the only thing they had going for them was branching is really good, and then Spectre happened. <laughs> yeah, no. Um, CPUs have gotten better, except Spectre. Um, <laughs> so now they have, now I'm talking about now is, as in 2001. Um, they have streaming instructions called SSC on Intel and Neon on ARM. Um, they, you can generate uh, single instruction, multiple data, data types that are really, really fancy. Um, they allow you to do vectorization. You have 128, 256, or if you're really, really rich and you pay Intel a lot of money, you get 512 bit wide registers. You can like shove a lot of um, data inside a single register. Uh, you can operate, if you're operating on these registers, if you're really, really fast, uh, like single instructions, uh, single or like few CPU cycles, minimal latency. Uh, reading a single element of that register, it was really, really slow, so don't do that. Um, we used to use assembly, uh, and then suddenly we had compiler built-ins, um, so now you have something that is decent to read, except on ARM. Um, yeah, that, that's never gonna change. Um, GCC can do a lot of work for us. You can tell a type is a vectorized type and it will do things like uh, consider it a, a, a scalar value so you can just operate on it. It's pretty interesting. Uh, it has some gotchas around infinities and zeros. Uh, but the problem is now you have, you are a step one and you want to go to step two and yeah, no. Um, so this is why I wrote Graphene uh, five years ago. Uh, MIT licensed, uh, has standard stuff for any open source project, on open source free software project. If your project doesn't have this standard stuff, you suck. Um, so it supports different type vector uh, OS, um, streaming uh, data types, uh, SSC2 if you fall into a time hole into 2002, uh, SSC41 if it's just like 13 years older. Um, Neon for ARM 32-64, GCC vectorization, works on Windows, on Linux. Um, uh, I still manually test on macOS because CI there sucks. Uh, it exposes G types, properties and signals for like your uh, GeoJet based code. Uh, it comes with GeoJet introspection and it's fully documented because yay. A um, bunch of people use it. It's really interesting and if you plan on using it to if you're planning on doing some math stuff, 3D stuff, or if you are just curious about how CPUs work these days, it's a good project to use. Uh, also, please come back and check my math because I'm trash that never finished university. Um, so I have no idea what I'm doing most of the time, <laughs> to be fair. Um, this is the website, the API, and the Git repository that you can just clone. Thank you very much. So for the next one, we'll have Richard Brown teaching you how to survive a speaker having a heart attack on stage. Let's welcome. Yeah. So yeah, something totally not technical. At the Open Caesar Conference this year, we had a speaker who was giving his presentation and had a heart attack. Um, luckily, he survived as well. In fact, he's going to be going back to Nuremberg and giving another presentation at a SUSE conference and I, already. Um, but we learned a whole bunch of lessons in that. So if you're organizing any open source event, the first thing I, I, like, we totally didn't do and we really regretted is we didn't have any uh, 
uh, contact details for any sort of next of kin for anybody. You know, I think every conference should be at least asking that. In fact, at OpenSUSE conferences, we're now thinking of making it mandatory for every speaker, for every attendee, ideally. Because we basically spent two days of having no way of getting hold of anybody in this guy's family about, you know, what was going on with him, which hospital was he in, what to do, etc. cetera. Um, and it, it sucked. It sucked for all of us organizing it. Um, you know, make sure you have first aiders on site, you know, like we have here with the ambulance people, which is awesome to see. Thank you, Guadak. Um, yeah, we, we didn't do that. We lucked out. We actually had two first aiders in the audience, which was great. They dived in. They saved this guy's life. Um, but, you know, you keep this stuff in mind. Nasty stuff happens. And if you're attending, there's a whole bunch of stuff you can do to make people's lives easier. One, keep your ID on you, passports. This guy didn't have his passport with him, so we had like no details about who he was, really, if we hadn't been speaking to him beforehand. So that was terrifying. He actually lost his passport because we couldn't find it in his hotel room either when we had to go find his hotel. So, you know, keep your ID with you, keep your hotel key with you, that's helpful. Um, and, um, you know, you, we've all got mobile phones, Everything with Android and iOS now have this like lovely medical ID or like emergency contact detail feature where you know they can actually unlock and get like at least a phone number to call. That's really cool. Please use it um, and keep it up to date because yeah, it you know it sucks if it happens to you. It also sucks to everybody trying to take care of you um, after that. Um, and yeah, that's it really. So yeah, nice and short for me. Thank you very much. Should have just give you a link. Given a link. Is it just a? Uh, no, this PDF that I sent you. Okay, for the next one, we'll have Zishan Ali talking about Zbox and flying. Probably let's just wait a bit to get the presentation up and running. I just down, down key, you know? Yeah. Down key to the, for the next? I don't know. How do you do this? I think it's done. Yeah. No, no, it's fine. Yeah. Yeah, okay, let's nice welcome. Hello. <laughs> so, um, who am I? Zishan Ali. I think most of you know me, but newcomers don't. Um, I'm, uh, well, I work for Red Hat, and I've been involved in GNOME for a while. Um, update on flying. Two years ago, I had a, um, a lightning talk together with uh, Neil, because Neil is a fixed wing pilot, which means a plane, and I'm, I was a helicopter pilot back then only, and uh, we both were saying which one is better, but uh, now I am also a fixed wing pilot. So when I say helicopters are better, you have to believe me now. Uh, and fixed wing are not that bad either. You can fly them. They're much cheaper and easier to manage. Uh, the other thing. Okay, so I decided to uh, oxidize GeoClue, which means uh, uh, porting it to Rust um, from C, only the service uh, side of code, because I was getting tired of crash reports and I don't like fixing them. <laughs> um, uh, besides, I love Rust. And um, one of the things that I needed to solve was Dbus, because that's what GeoClue is, it's a Dbus service. Um, and there's a crate in uh, Rust for that uh, Dbus RS. Um, I really wanted to use it, but I had a lot of problems with that, including having an API that even Sebastian, who is a Rust expert here, even he didn't, couldn't figure it out, so I thought, okay, this is not <laughs> worth doing. So um, I decided to do Dbus from scratch. Um, how hard can it be, right? Um, actually, it turns out it's not as hard as you would think. It is hard, it's very hard, but it's not as hard as you would think. Um, so I created this uh, project called Zbus. It's a Dbus uh, implementation from scratch, all in Rust. Um, I already met um, uh, method calls in one week of starting the project. 
Uh, I'm almost done with the G variant side, which is the packing format Dbus uses. But this format is used by other projects and other contexts as well, not just Dbus. It's a very efficient way of uh, storing and transferring data. Um, uh, this, this part is almost done. Um, as you can see uh, in here, I can create a connection um, and I can um, you know, call method call and get a response and parse the response and stuff. I'm just getting a machine ID here. Um, this is like in a few months in my spare time only. It's, my, it's not my job. <laughs> um, I have to separate the gvariant crate now um, and be able to receive messages because that's what GeoClude needs to do. Um, signals, things like that, async for support, which is coming into Rust stable now. It's really exciting times for async uh, st uh, uh, API and Rust and stuff, and syntax. Uh, also need high le level API. Uh, the, the API, is, uh, the usage I showed you, it's just low level, like sending messages, but we want uh, something high level like objects and methods in that way. Uh, code generation, um, also maybe macros for make it easy. Uh, and a lot of these easy stuff that there's way too many of that, but all of them easy, so it should be possible. Um, that's all. And if you want to help with Zbus, if you want to uh, looking for any you know Rust project or something, please come to me, talk to me, and we can we can sort it out and we can work together on this. That's all. <laughs> Okay, then for the next one, we'll have Fabian Oaken talking about finding face detection effects in cheese. Let's welcome. Okay, hello. Uh, uh, I've been a contributor of PTV before. I, I've been in for uh, kind of, uh, of a long time in PTV and then I started to get interested in cheese. I wanted to do something that maybe can be... Uh, I, I was trying to find something that it is not implemented in let, like in in GNOME, and I wanted to to implement in uh, in in cheese, and I, I found out that these effects of uh, that there are like a snapshot filters doesn't it exist there, and if you find if you I started to look for these thing alternatives in in software, for example in mobile apps. There are like a lot of applications that are using this kind of face effects. There are, for example, Snapchat, Facebook, Instagram, FaceApp, and Meet Me. Well, Face, yeah, basically them. Uh, in the desktop apps, in MacOS. Yeah, in MacOS we have Photo Booth and Fun Booth, and well, and in Windows there are Cyberlink and. Several in UCAM and, and many CAM. These applications in, in 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 the mobile environment they are very sophisticated. But if we go to the desktop environment, they they are not as sophisticated and, and as in the mobile environment. So maybe we can have like a lot of potential to to improve here in cheese. And I decided to do it. Is as a as a as a part of my dissertation project, I took the opportunity to to start on it. But this idea was not my was not mine. I, I started to search about it, and I then reali realized that there was already a, a girl that got, that applied for the uh, the all outreach program. That was this girl that already was adding these overlay effects. And you could add in, for example, in whatever part of the face you detect, you could add images. There was some issue for, for that, and it wasn't merged because it was uh, slow and, and ba well, basically that. And also, it has another limitations. For example, 
it was restricted to static images, it doesn't allow animations and only work for a single phase. If you look at the code, it actually accepted that last phase. So, so I started to to develop these plugins for cheese. And it is basically a, a set of elements. One is cheese face track that does detection and tracking because it does tracking because it, it is usually faster than detection. So I start like, I do detection in one frame, then I track like in the next 10 frames, then I start to detect again. And, and then I try to correct if that, if the, if the uh, target is lost, the, the target of the tracker is lost. Then I detect the landmarks that are, are these key points on, on the face. There are like 68 key points. And there is another element, cheese face overlay, that is a JSON file in which you pass like a, like a metadata of, of how the animation should behave, for example, you can pass multiple frames and you could have, if you build a, most big, uh, a bigger JSON file, you will have an animation like what I will show in this video. Oh. Uh, yeah, basically it's using, it's a modification of cheese with these plugins and this is, these animations are, are done because of the, <laughs> yeah, basically, basically that. This, these are receiving the instructions from, from the JSON file and then I decided to write everything again because it was very hard coded because I had a lot of deadlines in my university project and I, <laughs> Time's okay. up, time's up, sorry. Yeah, well, that's it. <laughs> if someone ha wants to help, just talk to me because I really need help. Thanks. I don't really have anything to say, but I thought it would be cool to show these photos that uh, are kind of now in the public domain, basically. So these are photos from uh, the uh, Librem 5 in the factory. So now I'll just be a manual slideshow. So it's, it's on its way. Uh, maybe these, I'm wondering, could these be left up over the break for people to see? Well, I, I, you need it. Oh, wow. Well, there we are. There we are. There's the Librem 5 in production. Thank you. So basically, I, I think that's all for the lights in talks. And the coffee break to have already started outside. So go outside, grab, grab coffee, and remember to come back. Uh, five, five o'clock for the keynote. Thanks.